as a special case of the rule for rational functions, I can consider 1 over x to the n, where n is a positive integer, so it's going to be x to the minus n. Then we have, if our x0 is non-zero, we still have our evaluation rule. Limit as x goes to x0, x to the minus n is just x0 to minus n. So what that says, if I take n to be any integer, x to that power, you take the limit, you're just going to evaluate. If you're using a negative exponent, you just have to be careful that you're not sticking zero in. All right, in general, if I take x to the s, where s is any real number, we're still going to have the evaluation rule. The only hitch is you have to make sure what's coming out makes sense. So no square roots of negative numbers and no dividing by zero. If you get a number otherwise, then that's going to be your limit. All right, example, limit x going to 2 of x to the minus 3. My rule says just stick your number in. So 2 to the minus 3. Minus sign says put in the bottom. 1 over 2 to the third power gives me 1 eighth. If I take the limit as x goes to 4 of square root of x, that's just x to the 1 half. So our rule applies. If I put 4 in there, that gives me 4 to the 1 half. Square root of 4 is 2. It's a perfectly good number, so that's going to be my limit. Okay, now I have x to a power, so we need one more rule, and that's going to give us anything where we're taking a function, which is just in terms of x to powers, and then sums and quotients, and then take to whatever power you like. So our rule is going to be composition rule. It's going to do what you would think. If I have a composition and I take the limit and things are set up nice, that's just going to be evaluation of your composition. So let's take a look. What we're going to have is, we're going to have f and g. The limit as x goes to x0 of g of x is going to be equal to l. And then we're going to want to push l through f. So we're going to have the limit as x goes to l of f of x is going to be equal to some limit. But here we're going to insist that it also be equal to f of l. Then we're going to have that if we take the limit x goes to x0 of the composition, we're allowed to push the limit through f to the inside, which is the same as saying you just evaluate your function at big L, the limit for g of x as x goes to x0. So net effect is going to be what we call continuity. We're going to see that in a lecture or two. The idea with a continuous function is that you're allowed to just move limits from the inside to the outside and vice versa. All right, why is this true? Well, so from the point of view of the delta epsilon test, what's happening? Somebody's going to challenge you with an epsilon. Okay, that's going to be the challenge for the composition f composed with g. All right, so what we're going to need to do, okay, let's suppose this is our limit over here. Say f composed with l, which I'm calling m. The challenge is going to be with an epsilon. What we need to do is to find a delta over here so that if we apply f composed with g to the interval of x0 spread out by delta, that thing's going to have to map into my interval all the way on the other side. Well, if I know I have the limits when I consider f and g at the right points, then I can just use the delta epsilon test for each of those. So if I'm given epsilon, since I have my limit for f, we know that there's going to be some delta prime around l we're going to make an interval out of L spread by delta prime so that when I hit it with F, it squeezes into this interval here. So it's half of it. All right. But note, if I have this delta prime here, well, I can use the challenge as this is an epsilon for my G here. And then for the G, we'll be able to find a delta that lets us squeeze the interval around X0 into this interval here. So you're doing two epsilon tests at once. On the one, where you're starting out with your g, that's going to be one function, so epsilon here, delta here. And then when I push through, we're going to have to also do this for f, which will have delta here, epsilon over here. What happens is, now when I compose, if I'm starting over here, this squeezes into this interval, but we know that this interval squeezes into that one. So when I compose, we're guaranteed that this interval squeezes into this one. 
All right, very fast and loose, but pictorially, that's the idea of how the composition works. Okay, examples. How would you use this in practice? Of course, we'll want more sophisticated functions later on. This will be more helpful, but here are the way you use it. Okay, I take my limit, x goes to two, x squared plus one raised to the third power. We know how to do polynomials, so I don't have to bother with this, but we just want to use this as something for an application. So what do you do? Well, I know, okay, if I take the inside, whatever's on the inside, if I take something and raise it to the third power, we know that the cubic function that goes with that is going to have its limit at any point. We already saw the polynomials. To get the limit, you just evaluate. So I'm going to push the limit to the inside here. So the cube is now on the outside. So all I have to do is evaluate this. I get a 5, and then I can cube to get 125. All right, something with a little bit more meat on it. Take the limit as x goes to 7. We're going to take the cube root of 1 plus x. So here we know to get the limit of whatever to the 1 third, we're allowed to just evaluate. So I'm just going to push the limit to the inside. And that's going to give me, OK, well, 1 plus 7. I put a 7 in there. It gives me an 8. 8 to the 1 third, cube root of 8 is equal to 2. Another rule we'll get a lot of mileage out of is the squeeze theorem. So for the squeeze theorem, we're going to have three functions, f, g, and h. They'll be defined on an interval around x0, which will be the point where we take the limit. They don't need to be defined at x0, because the limit will ignore that point anyway. So we'll have this inequality, and we're going to assume that the limit of f and the limit of h are going to be equal. If this happens, then the limit of g is also going to be equal to this limit we're using for these two. So the picture is pretty easy to visualize. You have a function on top, function on the bottom. Our g of x is going to be trapped between them. And since the limits are going to be equal, we're going to see that all three functions are going to meet up at that best fitting point over x0. So g of x is being forced to have the same limit as f and h. So let's see how we would use the squeeze theorem. All right, consider limit x going to 0 of x squared sine of x. OK, by our heuristic rule, what we would do is stick your 0 in, see if a number comes out. If a number came out, then we would just assume that's going to be the limit. So here, if I stuck 0 in for each of these, 0 squared 0, sine of 0 is 0. Remember, 0 is going to be the y value on the unit circle. So the y value that goes with the angle 0 is 0. So this is definitely going to be 0. Let's see how the squeeze theorem applies, just because it's a case where we believe the answer. All right, how do I start? First off, if I was just given this, the first thing I would want to do is get control of sine of x. So the way I do that is, well, I know sine of x always lives between minus 1 and 1. All right, y values in the unit circle, those y values never get bigger than 1 or less than minus 1. So since this inequality is true, I can multiply through by x squared. x squared is always going to be bigger than or equal to 0. So when I multiply by it, it will not disturb those inequalities. If I throw a minus sign through there, I'd have a problem. Since x squared is always bigger than or equal to 0, we're fine. So that changes things to minus x squared, less than or equal to x squared sine x, less than or equal to x squared. So let's take a look at the picture that goes with this. x squared is going to be the parabola on top. Minus x squared is going to be the parabola facing down. So let's see, that's going to be, this is going to be h, this is going to be f, and then in the middle, we have our x squared sine of x. So what's happening here is this function, it's going to oscillate going into the origin. And as it's oscillating in, it's getting driven down to 0 also. Now, what's going to happen with the squeeze theorem? We have to check the limits. The limit on x squared as that goes to 0. It's a polynomial, so I know I can just stick in 0. So that's going to go to 0. Minus x squared, polynomial, so that's also going to go to 0. So since the Functions in the outside, when I take their limits, go to 0. The thing on the inside also has to have its limit going to 0. So that's going to agree with what we already knew. Let's try an example where things aren't so clear. I'm going to try limit x going to 0, absolute value of x, cosine of 1 over x. So if you tried sticking your 0 in here, you're fine in the first part. But in the second part, 
with cosine of one over zero, and that's not gonna make any sense. Okay, no matter how you try to make sense of cosine of one over zero, you're not gonna get anything numerically helpful. So, same procedure as we did in the previous example. Cosine of whatever, as long as this is defined, what's gonna come out is gonna be between minus one and one. All right, cosine gives us the x value on the unit circle. Those x values, biggest they can get is one, smallest they can get is minus one. So it doesn't matter what I put in here, this thing is gonna make sense. Now, we have this, so I wanna make it look like that, so I'm just gonna multiply through by absolute value of x. Just like before, absolute value of x is always bigger than or equal to zero, so if I multiply through with the inequalities, that's not gonna disturb the inequalities. So that's just gonna give me this, and then what do we have? Let's take a look at the picture. Absolute value of x is looking like the v on top, minus absolute value of x is the v on the bottom, and then when we sketch this, what we're gonna see is this thing's gonna oscillate, and it's gonna oscillate back and forth. The closer you get to zero, it'll oscillate more and more, but not a problem because we have the absolute values function on the top and the bottom, that's gonna make this thing get driven down to zero. Okay, so take the limits on the outside functions, minus absolute value of x is gonna to go to zero as x goes to zero, absolute value of x goes to zero as x goes to zero, so the thing in the middle by the squeeze theorem also has to go to zero. So this thing, although we can't make much sense of the actual function if we try to evaluate, squeeze theorem, saves our hides.